What's up? What's going on? Let me start out by uh, congratulating you on whooping everybody and having, <laughs> having the champion basketball team. Uh, I want to begin by saying uh, thank you to my hosts, plural. Uh, I'll start with Professor uh, Keita. Thank you for the invitation. It means so much to me. And in fact, I'll say in Kiswahili, uh, um, uh, for every grain of sand on the African seashore, I thank you. Ah, Sikito. Uh, Joyce, what can I say, sister? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for holding me down. Dr. Okuma, it has been a real pleasure to, to meet you, to shout you out, to break bread, to sit and just talk and do this vibration. Anyway, so since you brought me here, and since I'm a little hungry, and they're going to take me out to eat, what's up, Villanova? <laughs> I, want to, I want to have some fun with you all today, but I want to get right into it. I'm not going to formally present um, like a scholarly conference style paper. I see a lot of uh, really beautiful people in the audience, and I would prefer to have a dialogue with you. Is that all right? I prefer to have a dialogue with you. So what I would like to do, and I always try to, I like to tell people what I'm going to do. What I would like to do is to have a, maybe a good 30, 35 minutes or so of sort of exposing you to uh, Du Bois, and then we can have a dialogue after. Does, does that sound cool? So I'm not going to hold you long. We're going we're going to just do it. But anyway, just to get started, just to lay out some of this framework, uh, this is the way I would like to open. One of, the, one of the major themes of Du Bois's discourse revolves around race and racism, or more specifically, the critical, systematic, and social scientific study of race and the political economy of racism. However, race and racism were only part of the problem that faced a dying humanity from Du Bois's point of view. There were other important life-threatening and liberty-denying issues, some of them involving sexism, capitalism, and colonialism, among infinite others. But no matter what the issue was that Du Bois critically engaged, it should be emphasized that his major preoccupation was ever the dialectic of oppression and liberation. So that's going to be one of the major dialectics here, oppression and liberation. Right? This is something that preoccupies Du Bois. For Du Bois, oppression was always the central issue. Early in the history of sociology, Du Bois emphasized race, gender, and class. Sociology for Du Bois was a means to seek solutions to social problems. And so now you can see from Du Bois's conception, a social scientist should always be preoccupied with solving social problems. Sociology, it should be duly noted, was simply one of many disciplines that Du Bois contributed to and methodologically drew from in his efforts to seek solutions to social problems. His work was wide ranging and anticipated several contemporary theoretical revolutions and radical political positions, particularly Africana studies emphasis on linking academic excellence and intellectual innovation with political activism and social organizing and its interdisciplinarity and use of multiple methodologies. And so one of the things I want to lay out for you up front is that it seems to me that Du Bois was interdisciplinary and intersectional before we had terms for interdisciplinary and intersectional. And so doing all that, let's get right into it. <clears throat> du Bois was born February 23rd, 1868. He was educated at Fisk, Harvard, and the University of Berlin. He studied philosophy, history, politics, and economics, and he's the first African American to graduate from Harvard University. Again, being a very interesting figure, Du Bois had an 80-year publishing career. He started publishing at the age of 15 and did not stop until he was 95 years old. He co-founded the NAACP, and he was one of the first scholars to, to seriously study African Americans' retention of African culture and contributions to American culture. And interestingly, Du Bois passed away the day before the March on Washington, March on Washington being August 28, 1963. Du Bois passes away August 27, 1963. And in fact, Martin Luther King Jr. says his specter seems to haunt, if you will, the proceedings of the March on Washington. Now, here, I understand Du Bois to be interdisciplinary and intersectional. When we talk about interdisciplinary, this means that Du Bois draws from uh, two or more 
different disciplines. And he was doing this before they had this term. So it's going to be really, really clear to understand if we're going to talk about Africana studies, we're talking about, I'm going to put it very crudely, an interdisciplinary discipline. <laughs> I'm being wordy, y'all. We're talking about, watch this, watch this, Dr. K. Tuck. We're talking about a transdisciplinary figure. When I say trans, I mean somebody that transgresses and transcends the boundaries of artificial and arbitrary disciplines. So just because everybody else in the academy is going to go along with these little disciplinary boundaries and borders, Du Bois didn't. And so now you can see, to a certain extent, Du Bois was a rebel, if not a revolutionary, but I'm going to get to that later on. Now, Du Bois was also intersectional, meaning essentially that Du Bois saw that the importance of studying race, gender, class, and sexuality, that these were always interconnected. They were always intersecting. And so now I challenge you all not to see Du Bois simply as a race man, right? He was also studying gender, class, and obviously sexuality, that's going to be something that comes along a bit later. So in order to really understand Du Bois, it's important for us to begin on a black feminist note. And in particular, Du Bois was influenced by the National Association of Colored Women. Now, most people don't realize. They say the NAACP, and they don't realize that Du Bois was actually troping on the organization of his surrogate mothers. His mother passed away when he was only 16 years old, March 23rd, 1885. And it was these women of the Black Women's Club movement, the National Association of Colored Women, who took the 16-year-old orphan, quote unquote, in. And he paid tribute to them when he named his organization after their organization. But again, most people don't really dig black feminism or womanism. They don't get into it. So they intellectually erase this very important part of understanding Du Bois. And in fact, they can't help but to misinterpret Du Bois if they don't understand the National Association of Colored Women. And this organization was founded by Harriet Tubman. Whew, I'm going to say it slow. Harriet Tubman, the godmother of our people. When we can't talk about African Americans if you don't start with Harriet Tubman. This is very important. And so she helps to found what Darlene Clark Hines says is the first great civil rights organization in the history of this nation. And most people have never heard uh, of the National Association of Colored Women. So Harriet Tubman helped to establish this. Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, Mary Church Terrell, and the name of the, your lecture, uh, this, this very distinguished lecture that I'm so honored to be here the great Ida B. Wells. We're going to talk a little bit more about her in just a minute. And Margaret Murray Washington, yes, as in Mrs. Booker T. Washington. But this organization, the National Association of Colored Women, these are the foremothers of contemporary black feminism slash womanism. They engaged a wide range of issues, including civil rights, women's rights, voting rights, lynching, poverty, crime, alcoholism, health, and education. So you can see the wide range of issues that they are engaging. And in fact, at some point during its more than 100-year history, the NAACP went on to engage these very same issues. Look at how Du Bois is influenced. A lot of times, people erase or render invisible black feminist influences, and I want to put them front and center. This is what it means to do uh, Africana studies. So we don't just start with uh, Du Bois's European influences. It's important to start <laughs> where he started, in African America. That's where you are right now, at least, for a few minutes, Villanova. Welcome to Wakanda. Did I say that out loud, Brother Okama? <laughs> I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. This is the major motto. <laughs> this is the major motto of the National Association of Colored Women, lifting as we climb. And you can see we need that today. And in fact, you have no real conception of a Me Too movement if you don't rock with this. And in fact, they influenced the Me Too movement. But again, people have a tendency mm, to erase women and to render them invisible. And what I want to do and what I believe is important is that we should actually amplify and accent the contribution of women to society. This is very important. This is something that Du Bois did And talking about the National Association of Colored Women, we have to begin with its first president, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. And it was at Mrs. Ruffin's house that Du Bois ate every Thursday night when he was at Harvard University. And in fact, the reason I know this is because I read his autobiography. And in his autobiography, Du Bois says that Mrs. Ruffin's husband was a judge, 
one of the first African-American judges. This is coming out of the Reconstruction period. And if you really want to read something, read Black Reconstruction by Du Bois, 1935. And he'll tell you between 1865 and 1877, that 12-year period, you have a transformative period in the United States of America. And African-Americans were front and center and played a vanguard role. And Du Bois was preoccupied with this. So Mrs. Ruffin took Du Bois in and fed him. He didn't stay there, but she fed him. Du Bois said he borrowed many books out of her library, and he said he was ashamed to admit that he didn't return many books to her. He was a student at Harvard. What's up, Villanova? You know, and so he was doing what he needed to do to get through undergrad, and she was very, very gracious and fed him there. Why? Because Du Bois couldn't eat in the dinner hall because it was segregated. At Harvard, y'all, y'all hear what I'm saying? At Harvard, you see, they wouldn't let Du Bois there, and he couldn't join any of the clubs, yada, yada, yada. Uh, along with Mrs. Ruffins, you have Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She was considered the Toni Morrison of the 19th century, one of the greatest literary figures this country has ever produced. And in fact, uh, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was also a abolitionist. And so this is where we uh, emphasize black feminist abolitionism. There were many of them, but again, most people only have a tendency to focus on the men, but she was a black feminist abolitionist and she was deeply involved in the National Association of Colored Women. We go on from there to Mary Church Terrell who founded the NAACP in Boston, she was also the third pre president of the National Association of Colored Women as well. So she was a key figure uh, in this movement. And then here we are with Ida B. Wells, a key figure in the National Association of Colored Women. Obviously, you all have some profound uh, connection to Ida B. Wells as this lectureship is named in her honor. Ida B. Wells was the greatest anti-lynching crusader, anti-lynching crusader in the history of this nation. Right? And so not only was she a strong woman, she also was not afraid to be politically active. And we need more models of this because oftentimes we only see men, right, or they raise up men first and foremost as being politically active. But you have a lot of radical women. And Ida B. Wells is doing this during the period that they call the suffrage period. This is where women are arguing for the right to vote. And let me remind you that women have not even had the right to vote for 100 years in America. And so I question whether we actually live in a democratic society if half the society can't vote. Is anybody with me? So not even 100 years. I'm just trying to get you hip in here today, Villanova. So haven't even been able to vote for 100 years. And so that's why the Me Too movement is very important, because people are treating women differently. Can, Y'all can't hear me? They can't? OK. Hey, how you doing? Having a good time. OK. And the last major figure for the National Association of Colored Women is going to be Dr. Anna Julia Cooper. She was educated at Oberlin College, Columbia University, and the University of Paris, where she wrote her dissertation in French, got her PhD in 1926, if I'm correct. She published one of the first great works of black feminism, which is called A Voice from the South in 1892. Uh, I've already pointed out she was a key member of the National Association of Colored Women, and she went on to become a university president. And again, I've talked about these women as being key suffragettes. Now, you might ask, why is there a such thing called the Black Women's Club movement? That's because in the White Women's Club movement, they drew the color line. And so Ida B. Wells said that she would not, she don't want to be nowhere that she is not wanted. Sound like a real African American. And they formed their own organization. And this is how, this was the first great civil rights organization in the history of this nation. And in fact, most people point out that Du Bois helped to found the greatest civil rights organization in the history of this nation, the NAACP, and they don't realize that it was influenced by the National Association of Colored Women. From there, we go to Du Bois's high school photo. You can clearly see he was the only African American at his high school, and in fact, he was the only African American in his town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. I don't need to point out to y'all which one Du Bois is, because he's the only one in there. Mm -hmm. 1884. Du Bois goes from Great Barrington, Massachusetts to Fisk University. You may ask, how on the earth is he going to be able to go to college? And his daddy done ran off. <laughs> and his mother passes away when he was only 16 years old. That's because the townspeople of Great Barrington helped Du Bois out. So here is, is, is an act of cooperation. This is actually sometimes where we can get along in America. You know that? It's beautiful, too, when we can actually get along and try to, oof, mm, 
I almost said, let's have a Coke and a smile and shake hands. But anyway, it's really, really important, though, to see this. And so Du Bois goes to Fisk, which is an HBCU. Anybody know what that means, HBCU? Yes, man, hey. I, it fills me up. Thank you. I'm so glad. You know, y'all doing some hardcore teaching out here. This is beautiful. Okay, so he attended Fisk from 1885 to 1888, where he studied Greek, German, Latin, classical literature, philosophy, ethics, chemistry, and physics. He graduated with an A.B. degree in 1888, and he delivered his commencement address on Bismarck from Germany. Imagine that. I'm prefiguring something. Du Bois goes from Fisk University to, oh, here's his uh, class photo, graduating class photo. Y'all see Du Bois there? They got him dressed up nice, too. He goes from Fisk to Harvard. He originally wanted to go to Harvard. They were not admitting African Americans at the time, so he ultimately does get a chance to go to Harvard. But there's a hiccup, as there always is with, uh, in terms of the African American experience. Harvard would not accept his BA from Fisk. Du Bois wanted to get his master's degree from Harvard, so that means that he had to start over. So he ended up getting two BAs. So he gets his second BA from Harvard University. At Harvard, he studies with William James. He studies philosophy with William James and George Santayana. He studies economics with Frank Tusig, and he studies history with Albert Bushnell Hart. He ends up getting his uh, BA, his second BA, in 1890. And then he goes on and he's admitted to the Harvard Graduate School where he is the Henry Bromfell Rogers Fellow between uh, 1890 and 1892. From there, Du Bois goes to the University of Berlin. Berlin had an incredible uh, reputation at this time, right? So after he finishes his master's in history in 1891, he goes on to attend the University of Berlin from 1892 to 1894. Notable alumni and faculty of the University of Berlin, you can see their names up there, and yes, that Hegel graduated from Berlin. Yes, that Marx, that Weber, right? This is fascinating. So you, this is pre-Nazism Germany. So it had this incredible reputation at the University of Berlin, and here's an orphaned, quote unquote, African American who ends up going to literally the most prestigious university in Europe at the time. And Harvard University, I should point out, was his backup school, right? This is the same place Einstein went. So Harvard was his backup school. Y'all don't hear me then here. Yeah. Harvard was his backup school. And in fact, I told y'all that when he went from Fisk to Harvard, they wouldn't accept his Fisk BA. I'm going to say this slow. When he went to the University of Berlin, they wouldn't accept his Harvard MA. That wasn't good enough. So he had to get a second master's degree. Y'all don't hear me in here. Woo! I feel so good. Okay, that's all right. We about to eat too. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm feel, I, I just feel like a woo. Here we go. So he did doctoral studies. <laughs> he did doctoral studies in historical economics, political economy, and social science, right? With Gustav von Schmaler, Adolf Wagner, etc. He attended. He attended. He was not the student. A lot of people keep lying on Du Bois. He was not the student of Max Weber. He attended his lectures. They were contemporaries. Right? And he completed his doctoral dissertation in December of 1893, but he was denied because of residency requirements and he ran out of scholarship money. Now, David Levering Lewis, one of my mentors who received two Pulitzer Prizes writing on Du Bois, actually argues that racism crept in here. That people are saying, well, hey, now, how this guy gonna come out of America? Uh, he's born five years after the Emancipation Proclamation. I don't know about this. What are we going to do? What kind of message will we be sending? And in German, they wrote, we're going to be flooded with American Negroes over here if we do this. So they denied him his PhD from the University of Berlin. Obviously, the people at Harvard felt bad. And so they finally, they let him into the PhD program there at Harvard again. And he continued to revise his dissertation. His dissertation is entitled, please hear me, the suppression of the African slave trade to the United States. That means that Du Bois literally is doing African studies. He's one of the first persons in the United States of America to do African studies, 
if you will. It may not be perfect, and there may be elements of this and that in it, but there was no such thing as sociology when Du Bois was in graduate school, and there certainly was no such thing as black studies or African American studies or Africana studies. And so he's really scraping and scratching and piecing this field together that we are in right now called Africana studies. And one of the first things he does when he graduates is he helped to found the American Negro Academy. I don't have time to go through all of this, but I want you to see that whatever discipline you're studying in, Africana studies is contemporary. African American studies is contemporary to these other fields, right? They start with the, Ameri uh, the American Historical Association, 1884, right? Economic Association, so on and so forth. But look, before you have this American Negro Academy, you have the founding of the National Association of Colored Women. So again, a black feminist note. And then the men finally get in line and get a backbone and say they're going to stand up and do something too. But I want you to see how influenced by black women Du Bois was, right? Very important. Some of the key members of the American Negro Academy would be Dr. Anna Julia Cooper, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Elaine Locke, uh, Carter G. Woodson. In particular, I've already discussed Anna Julia Cooper to a certain extent. Carter G. Woodson established in 1926 what was called Negro History Week. This blossomed in 1976, uh, immediately after the Black Power Movement. Uh, it became the uh, Black History Month, and that's what we know it as today. But notice, this is one of these major figures, and he also graduated from Harvard University. Very important. Elaine Locke becomes one of the first African Americans to get a PhD in philosophy from Harvard University. And then Du Bois. And so here, I want you to see the influence of multiple organizations and institutions on Du Bois's um, formulation. And so it's very important now, then, we're talking about pedigree, intellectual pedigree. Some people aren't used to associating African Americans with having any kind of intellectual history or intellectual culture. Oh, and I'm just laying some of it out for them today, Dr. Cage. I'm just laying some of it out for them today. Du Bois's first major work once he graduates from Harvard it's called the Philadelphia Negro. That's what it was called, 1899. And with this particular work, Du Bois helps to inaugurate American sociology. There was no such thing as sociology in America when Du Bois publishes this work. And in fact, Elijah Anderson, who taught for many years at the University of Pennsylvania, he's now at Yale, and somebody I admire a great deal. Elijah Anderson pointed out that somebody can get a BA, MA, and PhD in sociology in the United States of America and never read one word Du Bois wrote. Now, how is it that this guy can found the field of American sociology and you can go through and never read one word? We have a word for that in Africana studies. It's called epistemic apartheid. <laughs> it's a big word for intellectual segregation. And so I argue in my work that the social segregation actually filtered into the American Academy, and it became intellectual segregation. So if you're not a woman, then right, or, or, or if you're a woman, then your knowledge is invalidated because we only want masculine knowledge. If you're a person of African descent, or if you're Latinx, or if you're Asian American, and so on and so forth, right? And so you have this kind of intellectual segregation that's going on, and Du Bois seeks to break down a lot of these barriers, right? Really important. And so with this particular work, he synthesized historical sociology with political economy, urban ethnography, descriptive statistics, and social policy. And he helped to inaugurate what was called the Atlanta School of Sociology. The Atlanta School of Sociology was at Atlanta University, which also happens to be an HBCU. So here's a, a, a so-called black college or university that helped. They really have the first school of American uh, sociology in America starts at an HBCU. But most people start with the Chicago School which really starts 25 years after the Atlanta School. This is what I mean by epistemic apartheid or intellectual segregation. So a quarter of a century later, you get Robert Parks and the Chicago School. But somehow or another, if you look at the disciplinary histories of sociology, people mostly start with the Chicago School. And Du Bois is rendered intellectually invisible. Du Bois' most famous work is called The Souls of Black Folk. Y'all already know that. I don't need to tell anybody here about the souls of black folk. And in the way I teach it is I divide it into three different sections, right? And you can clearly see here that that first, chapters one through three, hinges upon the historical strivings of the souls of black folk. Chapters four through nine symbolize the social and political strivings of the souls of black folk. And chapters 10 through 14 
represent the spiritual and religious strivings of the souls of black folk. In the souls of black folks, there are five fundamental themes. There may be more, but this is just the way that I teach it and interpret it. The first major theme is going to be the veil. The second is the color line. Those are two different things. The veil and the color line are two different things. Double consciousness, arguably one of the most famous. Second sight and the gift theory. Notice here, I'm not going to go into Du Bois's brouhaha with Booker T. Washington. And I'm also not going to talk about the town of the 10th. I think that people have a tendency to freeze frame Du Bois at 35. That's how old he was in 1903. So some people don't realize Du Bois lived to be 95 years old. And in my work, I've wanted to focus on what did Du Bois do the last 60 years of his life? Well, I'll tell you, he actually helped to found the NAACP after 1903. So again, if they start and stop with the souls of black folk in 1903, they don't know Du Bois at all, right? And so now I want to look at Du Bois's major contributions to some of the, let's say, traditional disciplines. And obviously, if he gets a PhD in history from Harvard, he has a particular kind of nuanced relationship with history. And these are some of the subfields in history Du Bois either contributes to or he helps to inaugurate, right? First and foremost, history of race. People were not necessarily, there was no such thing as history of race. Du Bois helps to inaugurate, if you will, the history of race. African history, you saw with his PhD dissertation, right, that he's obviously interested profoundly in African history, American history, African American history. Please note women's history, intellectual history, so on and so forth. And from there, we can go and talk about Du Bois's training at the University of Berlin in historical economics. What is that? It's an interdisciplinary approach to the social sciences. Comprehensive economic histories that combine history and economics with politics, statistics, and sociology. And these are some of the major figures. And so look at Schmaler's name there. This was Du Bois's dissertation director at the University of Berlin. So he's a major, a major heavy, heavy figure within this discourse. And Du Bois studies with him. You can also see Max Weber. So Du Bois is very contemporary to many of the trends that are going on right, within the academy at the time. Du Bois publishes many, many articles in the area of historical economics. From there, we can talk about Du Bois's major contributions to sociology. And in particular, Du Bois worked in an area called historical sociology. So he's combining history and sociology. In Du Bois' mind, those were not necessarily two different things. That's very arbitrary and very artificial. People in the real world, let me say it slow, people in the community, they don't really care about what it's called. They care about what it's going to do to enhance the quality of their lives. That's what we should be talking about when we talk about African American studies or Africana studies. And in fact, they argue that we should be bringing the campus, we should be bridges from the campus to the community and from the community to the campus. And in fact, we should be constantly synthesizing knowledge from the campus with knowledge from the community and never privileging one over the other. And let me just share this with you as an aside. I'm the first person in my family to ever go to a college or a university. My grandmother only went to the third grade. And so I have to have a way that I can speak to my grandmother that's not condescending to her and my brothers and, and my mother and them, right? And so I challenge a lot of these old bourgeois professors mm, to be mm, more accessible as well. I think that's very important. Can y'all hear me in here today? I think it's important for us to speak at a level and in a language and with a logic that people can easily understand. That's something I actually got from Malcolm X. I don't know if Villanova was scared of Malcolm X, you see. But that's, that's one, something I really admired about Malcolm X. That every time he opened up his mouth, I could understand what he was saying. <laughs> Woo! And I said, well, imagine if you take some of that energy and bring it to the lectern. Now, some of it's hip hop, too, because y'all know, you know, you know I, I, OK, Wakanda, y'all not in? Kendrick Lamar, y'all, Drake, y'all never heard, okay. Nikki, well, Cardi B, just, y'all, y'all up on that? Like, come on now. Y'all saw the baby bump now. Come on. Okay, anyway, so, Du Bois, du Bois wow, Du Bois in education. Notice again that Du Bois doesn't divide things into disciplines, so he makes significant contributions to education. He publishes over 100 articles that are focusing not simply on African American education, but how does one go about socializing and educating people in the context of the United States of America? From there, we go on to talk about Du Bois' contribution to religious studies. What's up, doctor? Right? And so again, we need to acknowledge Du Bois is arguably the first sociologist of American religion 
and certainly the first sociologist of African American religion, even though he don't get the credit. And these are some of the major works Du Bois helps to contribute to religious studies. I teach a course on black liberation theology, so I'm really, really deep into this. I'm a, oh, my mother's a womanist theologian. I'm a PK, so y'all can hear a little bit of that. Some of it's Decipher Circle out of hip hop, and then some of it's just my mother doing her thing. The Gift of Black Folk, 1924, this is something that changed my life. And if y'all want to read something, I'm telling you, no matter what your religious affiliation or whatever your spirituality is, if you want to read something that'll change you, this book, 1980, Prayers for Dark People. Du Bois, like myself, doesn't uh, uh, believe in or doesn't embrace a lot of uh, mass religion or organized religion. So he was at Fisk, which is a religious school. Uh, uh, and he was at Wilberforce. And they asked him, you have to do prayers in your class and everything, and Du Bois didn't want to deal with that. So he wrote his own prayers. And so there's a book of prayers for dark people. It's phenomenal. It'll blow your mind if you get this. So with his religious studies, Du Bois contributed not simply to sociology of religion, but also to history of religion, philosophy of religion. What's up, Dan? philosophy of religion, anthropology of religion, psychology of religion, religious economy, and political theology, among others. Du Bois's work prefigures black Christian nationalism, black liberation theology, and womanist theology. These are some of the major works. I'm finna wrap this up in just one second. These are some of the major works of W.B. Du Bois. I don't need to go through any of them, but I will tell you. People ask me this all the time. What's your favorite book by Du Bois? How did you already, how did you know? Oh, oh man. Okay, okay, man, you just, y'all, you just messed me up. I mean, in a good way, you know, like, like not bad meaning bad, but bad meaning good. That's Run DMC. Um, well, but, but see, I think Du Bois lived long enough for us to talk about early period Du Bois, middle period Du Bois, and late period Du Bois. Now, people do that with Marx. They do it with Weber. They do it with Foucault. So how come we can't begin to repair? In fact, I can tell you early period bell hooks. Y'all don't hear me. Middle period bell hooks. Late period bell hooks. In fact, I can tell you early period Angela Davis. Y'all don't hear me in here. Middle period Angela Davis. Late period Angela Davis. Birmingham, Alabama, 1944. Woo! -hoo! Angela Davis. So these are some of the major works. My favorite work, uh, middle period by Du Bois. is going to be Dark Water. He's already dealing with race, gender and class, and it, the sexuality part, that's going to be something that we're going to develop more so after the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 1970s. And certainly, Black Reconstruction is something that 737 page <laughs> changed my life. If you want to see what he was able to do with political economy and history and sociology and really sort of framing it and focusing on about a 12-year period in American society, that book, that'll change, that'll mess you up. And in fact, I argued that he helped, or Cedric Robinson argued, that he helped to inaugurate what's called Black Marxism with this work. Okay, I want to just keep this moving. Du Bois's idol was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass wrote five autobiographies. Du Bois wrote five autobiographies. Du Bois was also a major editor. I'm not going to go through all of them, but Du Bois began his career editing something called the Atlanta University Studies. And this is where they, he inaugurated sociology in the United States of America. He also edited the Crisis, which was the uh, periodical major magazine for the NAACP, that's his most famous. But later in his life, he edited something called Phylon, which is a Greek word for race. Du Bois was not simply a social scientist. He was also a major artist. And in fact, Du Bois published five novels, several volumes of poetry, three dozen short stories, and about two dozen plays. So this is how you can uh, all can see that this wild man here was, I have a degree in jazz studies. I have a BFA in jazz studies. Well, how do you end up doing social science? You switch over and you end up doing social science. See, Du Bois, so there's no boundaries. That's a very arbitrary thing. In fact, I argue Du Bois is anti-disciplinary. I don't want to get nobody in trouble. Villanova. But Du Bois didn't even believe in that. He said, man, I'm please tell me what it's going to do to help to liberate the people. How is it going to help us critique oppression? And if it doesn't do that in a way that's accessible to the masses of people, what good is it? And in that sense, Du Bois was also active in several organizations. This is what we mean in Africana studies by scholar activists, by intellectual activists. And in fact, I would say I'm trying to be an intellectual activist artist or intellectual artist activist. Mm, I'm an SP soldier, microphone holder. I'm repping my set from Bolivia to Boulder. Huh, can y'all hear me? Huh, can y'all hear me? 
<laughs> y'all, y'all not with me though. So some of the major social and political organizations that Du Bois is involved in, first and foremost, Pan-Africanism, the African independence movement, cooperative economics, obviously the NAACP, the New Negro movement, the Harlem Renaissance, the Civil Rights Movement. He even contributes to the Women's Liberation Movement. We're going to talk about that later. And Du Bois in 1950 got the Paris Peace Prize. He was a hardcore pacifist. He believed in disarmament. I can, don't y'all wish we could have that going on right now? What's up, Trump? Okay, when we talk about Africana studies, we're talking about an interdisciplinary discipline. These are some of the major disciplines within Africana studies that Du Bois either draws from or contributes to, right? And so again, when we talk about Africana studies, we're actually talking about an anti-discipline or at at minimum a transdisciplinary enterprise, okay? So it doesn't really fit into like nice, neat, Eurocentric, linear, masculinist conceptions of disciplines and knowledge. Right? It's very curvilinear. It's very, it blurs the lines between lots of different disciplines. We can go from here to talk about Du Bois's incredible contributions to Pan-Africanism. Right? So he believed in the unity of all people of African descent. And not only did Du Bois pioneer Pan-Africanism, he helped to popularize Pan-Africanism as a concept. These are some of his major works in Pan-Africanism and anti-colonialism. There was no term yet for um, decolonization. So you can't, I mean, you can go back and we can do a decolonial read of Du Bois, but I do think that we need to put him in the proper historical context first to understand what he was doing. And so I do argue that Du Bois contributes to the discourse on decolonization, right? And in fact, in 1965, uh, Kwame Kwame Nkrumah put out a book uh, called Neocolonialism. It's on Oxford University Press, and it's with that concept of neocolonialism, it really challenges any any concept of post-colonialism. Right? I think that's a subterfuge. I don't think that's real. If you go to the continent, you'll see ain't no post nothing. The same people in power back in the day are the same people in power. They might have changed some of the, you know, some of the trappings on the outside, but the same sort of uh, uh, colonization of Africa is still going on. It's just, it's just morphed and moved into a new form. From here, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. I've already talked about Du Bois as an interdisciplinarian and an intersectionalist. I would point out, again, scholar activists and scholar artists. I don't see, I think artists are creative beings. Am I right? Check this out. Teaching is an art. I'm rocking, I'm rocking my artistry for y'all right now, right? Teaching is an art. Am I right? Really good teaching. You shouldn't, nobody in here should be asleep. Everybody should be awake. You shouldn't need 59 cups of Starbucks to sit through my lecture. Woohoo! You right? Everybody should wake up. Teaching is an art. Am I right or wrong? But writing is an art. So hire teachers, hire professors, not artists. Y'all don't hear me though. Ooh, I'm telling you, I'm doing it big today. Y'all don't hear me, though. Look, ooh, we finna go eat, too. This is good. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Du Bois not only founded black studies, he also helped to found white studies. I'm not the only person that believes that. Go and read The Wages of Whiteness by David Rodiger. Can y'all imagine that? Du Bois helps to remind white folk that they actually have race. It's not just like non-white people that have race, (laughs) especially since the concept of race came out of Germany in the 15th century. They created the concept of race. And so now it's just like the 87% of the non-white people that have, come on, player. Come on, now. That's why I have some real issues with this term, people of color. Well, isn't white a color? Now, I got a little nieces and nephews. First day they came home from kindergarten, they showed me their box of Crayolas. And it's a white color in there. Mm. So it's white folk. You got it? We doing this all day, baby. You know what I'm saying? So do boys thought that... Within Africana studies, within so-called black studies, to a certain extent, you have to study some elements of whiteness. That's just like in women's studies. There's a serious critique of masculinity. Am I right along? Especially the hypertestosterone. You know, some of these people got this over-the-top masculinity. I ain't going to bring up hip-hop right now. This over-the-top masculinity. You know, where they got, just got to keep on flexing it. I mean, they must have, me must be really insecure player. Like, if you, you in the video, you got three dozen women dancing around you. Now, how insecure you And you got to pay them to dance around you. How small must you feel? You got to go to the shake club and throw money at people's booties. Now, when the last time you seen a man get up and women just throw money at their booty? I'm just asking y'all, Villanova. See, I'm about to catch a plane and go back to Boulder. Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. Du Bois was very influenced. His idol, Frederick Douglass. Major abolitionist. 
That's why I tell people all the time, if we're going to do Africana studies, let us really do Africana studies. You cannot really understand Du Bois if you're only looking at him from a Hegelian point of view or a Marxist point of view or a Foucaultian point of view or a Derridaian point of view. It's always somewhere in Europe. Why don't we develop a negritude interpretation of Du Bois? Why don't we develop a Frederick Douglass, a Harriet Tubman? I can do a Tubmanian interpretation of Du Bois. That's deep right there. Can y'all hear? Maybe they fell asleep. So, Douglass, essentially the Martin Luther King Jr. of the 19th century, one of the great figures, right, of the 19th century. Douglass was also, he said, a radical women's rights man. He was very, very committed to women's rights. And in fact, Frederick Douglass wrote and spoke so much on women's rights, there's a whole book. This is a book. This is a true story. This is a real book. Changed my life. I was in junior high school the first time I saw it. I couldn't believe it. I thought maybe they put the title wrong or something. I asked the librarian. She just started grinning. <laughs> and one of the first essays in this book is a note Frederick Douglass wrote to Harriet Tubman. And he said to Harriet Tubman, that she was the great inspiration for him, that he would, have not, he would have not fought for his freedom. He would have not stood up. It was her example, her glowing, glaring example that inspired him to fight for his freedom. That touched me on a very deep level, right? And so again, I'm trying to tell y'all, we've come back full circle on this black feminist note. So Du Bois' idol is even black feminist inspired. Wow, this is deep. So Du Bois makes several significant contributions to women and gender studies. A lot of people like to reduce Du Bois to being a race man. They don't understand that there's a long tradition, I'm gonna say it very slowly, of black male feminist. That is a thing. Black male feminist, black male womanist, right? Men of African descent who are deeply and profoundly committed to the rights of women and gender justice. You might be looking at one. Everybody with me? This is important to commit to this, especially in the midst of the Me Too movement. Why? Because we need models. This is one of the greatest things that studying history will give us, models. Some people in my generation, the so-called hip-hop generation, we sitting around trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm. We trying to reinvent the wheel. That's sad, too. These are some of Du Bois' major contributions. Notice he publishes over 75 articles in the area of women's rights, women's studies, gender justice, and my favorite piece, if you want to really read something quick, it's available online, it's called The Damnation of Women. The Damnation of Women, he puts it out in 1920. Du Bois was one of the most vocal male proponents for women to achieve the right to vote. That's why this piece comes out in 1920. But you can see even before 1920, Du Bois is already pushing in this direction. And he worked with many of the suffragettes. Really, really important. Du Bois said that African American women, black women in particular, had three great revolutions that they would contribute to. The revolution against racism, sexism, and capitalism. This is really important. And he says this in Dark Water. If you want to read something now, check out Dark Water. Here we are, y'all, home stretch. We've come back full circle. Du Bois' emphasis on political economy in the age of Trump. Mm -hmm. I believe that it is really important for us to get up on political economy. What is it? When we say politics, we're talking about power. When we say economics, we're talking about money. This is how some people are getting power and money off being sexist, off being racist, off being xenophobic. We have to challenge that, right? And the country has to be better than that. And this is something Du Bois gives us a model so that we can challenge this. Du Bois was interested in the political economy of race and racism, of racially gendered folk. That means that some people might just be women, but other women, I've noticed, they put some kind of descriptor in front of them. They'll say, oh, no, such and such was a black woman. Huh. Some people just women, and then some people, they put some color in front of it. Isn't this interesting? Mm. Du Bois is particularly interested in their lives and in their legacies. This is really important. So we have racial class struggle, racial capitalism, which is different than capitalism. That's why Du Bois isn't just a Marxist in, in any kind of pure sense. When you put race in front of capitalism, race in front of colonialism, you're talking about something else. Du Bois helped to inaugurate, as I said before, something called Black Marxism. If you really want to read something, please go out and get a book by Cedric Robinson called Black Marxism. It'll change you, right? So Du Bois helps to inaugurate what happens if you actually grapple with Marxism and couple it with critical race studies. Well, that's what we call Du Boisism, right? Profound. I'm not a Marxist. I'm a Du Boisist. Y'all don't hear me, though, right? This is really powerful. Du Bois joins the Socialist Party in 1911. He resigns from the Socialist Party in 1912. Why? He said, because they discriminate against, and I quote, Negroes, Asiatics, and Mexicans. 
he resigned. He quits the Socialist Party because he said, this ain't going to get me there where I, where I want to go. I can't be a part of this. They just set this up like the, the rest of the society. And going from there, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This one right here. I'm going to show you some of the clips, and we're going to close out. Here is Du Bois with the premier of Russia at the time, Nikita Khrushchev. So if Du Bois is so mm, minuscule, why is it that heads of state are willing to drop everything just to shake his hand and grin all in his face? Here, <laughs> here he is some more with his wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois, with Nikita Khrushchev. This is in Russia. The, the United States of America confiscated Du Bois' passport and would not allow him to travel for almost a decade. And this was very difficult for Du Bois. And this happened with McCarthyism, the House on Un-American Activities. And they actually ended up throwing Du Bois in jail when he was 82 years old. They threw Du Bois in jail. And so for all this talk about a talented tenth, none of them talented tenth people came to visit Du Bois. And in fact, the second signature I've seen on the jail log after Shirley Graham Du Bois is Langston Hughes went to visit Du Bois in jail. They put the man in handcuffs, 82 year old, even the prisoners, they said it's gonna be a prison riot. Even the hardened criminals said, let him go free, blah, blah, blah. They was keeping up with the case though, right? And they said Du Bois sent back the prisoners his books. Once, they, once, once he got out, this is, this is very profound, boy. This is really deep. Here is Du Bois with the premier of China, Mao Zedong. This is, again, Du Bois. Like, a lot of people like to reduce Du Bois only to America when Du Bois is a world historical figure, a world historical figure. Here is Du Bois with Mao Zedong again. Please note Du Bois' hands. You can see the discoloration on his hands. Du Bois had vitiligo. A lot of people say that Du Bois was elitist because he shook people's hands with gloves on. Well, I'm going to say it to you slowly, and I don't want to be too taboo. A lot of black people think vitiligo is contagious. So they don't realize you can't. Hey, anybody here ever heard of Michael Jackson? That's why he wore a glove, vitiligo. That's how the glove thing started. Most people don't realize that. More people would not shake his hand because they didn't know if it was contagious. Can, can y'all hear me? Wow, so there's a myth about Du Bois. I'm trying to explode for y'all, <laughs> right? Here we go. Here's Du Bois and Mao again, having a good laugh. You can see, like myself, Du Bois is a little small in stature. <laughs> so he's a little tiny man. He was also left-handed. So was Jimi Hendrix. And Obama was left-handed too now. I, mean, I, know I, mean, I know y'all miss him now. Yeah, they were talking about him, but woo, they miss him now. Here's Du Bois with the Nkrumahs. This is Du Bois with the great Kwame Nkrumah. Du Bois and Shirley Graham Du Bois with Kwame Nkrumah. Here are the Du Boises with the Nkrumahs. Kwame Nkrumah's wife was Egyptian. This is one of my favorite photos of Du Bois. We're closing out. We're going to go home. Um, you can see there's not a picture of Hegel or Marx or Bismarck or anybody behind Du Bois. That's a, it's a picture of Frederick Douglass in his private study. On the mantle is a picture of Bernhardt, Burkhardt, his son, who died because uh, nobody would treat his son. He writes about this in of the passing of the firstborn in the souls of black folk. And you can see, never forgot, his only son died at very, very, as a baby, uh, in fact. And you can see the picture there on the mantle. And so I'll close to you with Du Bois's words. His last message to the world, which he wrote out in 1957, he said, I have loved my work, I have loved people and my play, but always I have been uplifted by the thought that what I have done well will live long and justify my life that what I have done ill or never finished can now be handed on to others for endless days to be finished perhaps better than I could have done. Thank you, Villanova. Thank you. Oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Darkwater. Yeah, I'm always interested in discovering how people get introduced to the voice. Can you talk a little bit about when you first got introduced to the voice or, or, or I should say hip-hop, when you fell in love with hip-hop and when you fell in love with the voice? Definitely. It was my first grade teacher. It was 1979, if I'm correct. And it was Black History Month. This was a new thing. And my first grade teacher was handing out these little cards with d famous African-American figures on these little cards. And uh, somebody got Duke Ellington, someone got Paul Robeson, someone got Billie Holiday, somebody got Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and um, 
I got a Frenchman. Or so I thought. You know, me being young and headstrong, I'm, I'm in the first grade, and, and so I thought I was, you know, 